you know, I just stay in my lane because I think that what what one thing that's happened is people are so focused on these like ideological differences and everything's about dividing us, which I'm I'm comfortable saying too. And it's like, I don't think that this rep is representative of just our human spirit. Uh, I think that actually most people are very similar and they crave connection and love and they want to sh strive to create a better life for the people that come after them, their family, their children. But we've just become so like, it's become so corrupted and broken because no one, everyone's treading water trying to survive and, and there's a pressure on everyone to um, contribute and produce and provide. And it's like, it's hard with multiple incomes today. So I think that really breaks down the, the family structure and, and, and really like us as people, our motivations and our spirits and our, um, like our sense of belief that the future is okay. Miss Natalie Brunel, thank you so much for joining me today on this episode. And we can't we can't call you that much, I guess, into the future. So uh, <laughs> congratulations to you and Sam. Oh. And uh, thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Me. Thank you. Well, he's got a strong last name, so I'm excited about it. Um, no, it's great to see you. Thanks for having me. Yes. So we were just, you know, talking offline, obviously, about numerous different things. And, you know, some things are taboo and, and, and not. But, you know, we we're just talking about this cultural malaise that we're in. And I, you know, I, I think of, you know, like the kids, you know, I think of, um, you know, your your story, I think of, you know, my story is very different um, than yours, similar in many ways, but very different at the same time. And you coming over from Poland, when you're five years old, and I just got me thinking about kids. Again, you and I have talked about this over the last number of years too. I mean, I have four kids. You guys have kids. We'll, we'll have kids. It's you know, like what what world are we building right now? And it's like we we think about you know this this country. Like we don't we don't care about kids. I don't care what anyone says. It's like we can say all we want. Like if we just saved one life, you know, we got to get rid of guns because we got to save one life. But everything we do, the actions say very differently. We can't, we don't protect kids in schools. We're you know indebting them through the treasury market. We are, you know, pillaging and raping, and pillaging the family and the structure. The fathers are gone. Um, I, there's a lot there, there, but I know it's something that kind of, you know, tugs at at your heartstrings. And just from knowing you and, and knowing your story and everything, where where are we and, and where are we going? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot there to explore. Um, I think that we've seen the breakdown of a lot of values in society, including morality and the breakdown of family structures. And largely, I think the culprit is is economic and is the concentration of both economic and political power. Um, a lot of people are really struggling today. And when I think of children, I think of innocence and I think of hope. Uh, young people, I think, usually are supposed to have an easier time feeling hope than maybe someone who's, uh, who's, who's been through a lot of different experiences and struggles. But today, across the board, old and young, I think a lot of people lack hope. Um, Larry Fink, who now seems to be one of the biggest Bitcoin proponents, he wrote in a recent investor letter about how this lack of hope is the con most concerning economic data point he's seen, that four out of 10 Americans see no hope in the future. And it was a really interesting statistic to read because around me, I think we see the symptoms of the breakdown of hope. People feel like they're just treading water. Um, one job is not enough. Uh, there's a pressure on everyone in the family to provide. Sometimes multiple jobs are not enough. Uh, young people don't see the potential of being able to afford a home, which was not very difficult for just one or two generations before them. And so I think that that turns into um, very short term uh, actions and behavior where and Natalie Smolensky said this beautifully on my show, where people just turn to grift and it's like, get mine and get out. Everyone's in it for themselves, as opposed to being able to really drop our time preference and, and think about the future, plan for the future. You need to be financially secure in order to be able to think about the future. And all of us are just trying to survive day to day. And so we do, we see a breakdown within many aspects of society that leads to more crime, more health issues. And I think that 
if we can repair the very core problem, as opposed to maybe treating some of the symptoms or fighting over them, especially politically, then maybe we can start to remedy um, and, and create a, a better future that is more healed, that is more prosperous, that is um, more uh, unified rather than divided. And I hope that Bitcoin will help us get there. Yeah, it just... Boy, you know, you're like you, you you kind of touched on it too, right? We're we're killing our own in, inside of ourselves. We're you know we're sedating you know them. I, my my wife, as you know, is a is an attorney, um, does social security law, and the amount of people that she talks to and like hears from, and they're like fourteen year old girls talking about Xanax and stuff in in, in their high school, and like I didn't know what Xanax was till I was like thirty years old. I, I don't even know like it, it's so and it, it was just you know. We didn't grow up. We were, you know, you and I didn't get out of school that long ago, and and things have just so radically deteriorated that it's like you said. That's you know, you you were when you left school, you were in your fiat fiat job, I guess, of of journalism. You know, you got to see all that up close. Um, you know, what was what was the big thing, I guess, that the inflection point, I guess, of you realizing this the politics journalism news and trying to uh, bring merit, uh, show accountability and in, in, in really being a, a change agent, I guess. But when did you realize like this, I don't, I'm not going to fix it from this system like this, <laughs> this isn't going to work doing it this way. What was that that inflection point? Well, that inflection point was me learning about Bitcoin and having to um, humble myself and realize that I knew very little about economics and, and money and that I really needed to go on this journey to, to teach myself so that I could really understand this solution that was presented before me, which I fully, fully believe in now. And that's why I want to help educate people. Um, but I went through several um, experiences of ups and downs where I, I questioned a lot of things in the system. I'm first generation. So growing up, I, I just remember... It was it was kind of a struggle to not just assimilate, but just knowing that my family wasn't as well off as as the other families around us, and 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 dealing with that sort of financial scarcity, but hoping and and desiring abundance, and and working really hard for it, and putting my my focus on education as being sort of the the avenue where I could potentially achieve that. But then all of a sudden, seeing my parents lose everything in the financial crisis, and kind of thinking, well, is this system as fair and full of opportunity? As as it claims to have, because it seems like the people at the top are all bailed out when something goes wrong, and the working class and and the middle class sort of suffers. And and I want I I wanted to hold the powerful accountable. I think that's what drew me to investigative journalism. But it's it's really interesting to look back at my career because I I was definitely reporting on all the symptoms that we talked about: the symptoms of the broken system, cost of living going up, people struggling to make it, people struggling to afford education and and housing and healthcare, um, people turning to things um, like crimes, mental health um, issues increasing. And again, all of these are symptoms of something very, very broken at the core of all of our human act activity, which is the economic component, which is the money, who controls it, who issue it, issues it, how much is there, what is it backed by. Um, and I didn't understand any of that until I learned about Bitcoin. So for me, it was a very cathartic and transformative experience, also very humbling, like I said, because I realized that, wow, I just, I didn't, I didn't learn any of this. And had I known this, I might've been better equipped to face some of the challenges that I faced. And, and now I hope to help other people because we are really disadvantaged when it comes to learning about any of this in our, in our current school systems and, um, and in, in, in our work lives in general. Yeah, we uh, we were just talking this week on, on a space and, you know, just like the weaponization of language, just, you know, everything and just being, you know, like you just mentioned schools, like it's, you know, like my little ones are again, they're seven, five, three and one, and they know they're government run schools. They're not public schools, they're government run and in saying, you know, talking about things, how they really are, instead of using um I don't know, not analogies, but just, just, you know, government speak, I guess, in a way, and these just accepted terms and norms. Um, so you were, you were born in, in Poland, you were born in, and how do you, how do you say where you're born? Is it Wuch or Loch? How, how, yeah. how do you say yeah. it? Yeah. Wuch. Um, it means no, boat. <laughs> it doesn't? That's funny. Yeah. And it's, is and there, it, which is ironic because it's like right smack dab in the middle right of the, the country, middle, not on it? an yeah. ocean, but. That's hilarious. <laughs> 
That's really funny. So what, you know, kind of going back a little bit here, what, what were stories like? I mean, again, you, you moved when you were five over here, came to Chicago. What were the stories like from your family uh, and what they had witnessed over the last hundred years, basically, I guess, really the 20th century. What were some of the things that, that they had told you or that you had kind of just picked up on uh, for them? Obviously an area where there was a lot of humanity was focused and there was a lot of things going on in the 20th century, quite honestly, from where you grew up. So what was that like? Oh my gosh, so so many stories. Um, I wish I could remember all of them. And I'm actually really grateful. I sat my grandma down before she passed away two years ago. Wow. And I I just had I just I interviewed her basically in the way wow. that I've interviewed so many people in my life. I interviewed her about her young life and um, you know, I really believe in that meme that uh hard times create strong people, easy times or strong people create easy yeah. times, easy times create weak people, all that. Um, because we want to thank our sponsor. This show is presented by Bitcoin Trading Cards, an orange pill in a pack, making talking about things that normally make you want to cry fun and easy. The scarcest and most educational cards to ever exist. Available now. Definitely my parents and grandparents grew up in very, very difficult times and they were very, very strong people, all of them. Um, my parents and my grandparents obviously suffered through uh, World War II when they were really, really young. Um, and Poland was always it, it, like invaded from one side or another and had a difficult time in terms of just its, na its own national identity. My mom gr grew up uh, learning Russian as well as Polish. And, and they grew up under communism where there was scarcity and totally botched means of production because it was all all top down and and the price signals were were askew and so my mom would wait in lines for food and necessities and sometimes she would get to the front of the line she tells this story to me that um i was very very young she was holding me she got to the front of the line and they had just they ran out <laughs> there was no more wow. and i was i was hungry i was crying and so the lady in front of us turned around and gave us her some of her some of her food that she got from like the butcher or wherever we were um, because there was none left. And so a lot of things were conducted on the black market. Um, my grandma was a cook and her uh, husband, my grandfather, who I never had the chance to meet, I, I wish I did, um, he was a mechanic. And my grandma would like sell meat under the table on the black market for cash because again, it was like, that's that's what life under communism was. And so growing up, they dreamt of coming to the United States. Um, my grandfather, again, who he passed away before I was born, but he constantly told my mom, like, you got to get over there because that's where opportunity and hope is. And so my mom, she grew up on American movies and music and loved all of it. Every, everyone wanted things that were made in America during that time. And she just desperately wanted to come here and waited for decades. That's like when I think of my parents, I just think, wow, they waited for so long to be able to come here. And actually, when they finally were able to, a lot of people might have just said, no, you know what, we're now in we're in our 40s, whatever, we're just going to stay behind. And no, my parents came, they sacrificed, they started over, they, we did not have, um, we were not very you know, we didn't have many financial means when I was growing up. They slept on the sofa in this tiny apartment that we had. And everything was just about um, creating a better life for the children. And that meant so much to me because even though they were really tough on us, that was like the ultimate sign of love and sacrifice that they just wanted my brother and me to have a better life. And so they were willing to work so hard and start over and suffer and endure so much um, just for us. And there's nothing more selfless. And so I really have always, I think, been very ambitious because I just want to justify their sacrifice and make them proud. And so that definitely has informed my work for sure. That is, yeah, that's so cool. And it's, it's, it is fascinating. I mean, every Bitcoiner has their own stories or what drives them or why they, you know, it's like, it is like a, like a gauntlet. And in, in a way I always think of, you know, we didn't wake up one day and say, Oh, Bitcoin, that's it. Like we're, we're geniuses. And like, you know, Archangel, you know, came to you or Angel Gabriel came to you and is like, Hey, I, in a dream, I knew Bitcoin is thing. It's like, we have to go through these things. We have to go through these, uh, you know, fiat jobs, you got to go through these down spells, family things going on. And you, you get to it, you learn about gold and silver, maybe, you know, monetary history. And you're learning about these different things that get you to that level of finally seeing Bitcoin for what it is and understanding it. So I think it's really well said. What, uh, again, touching on Bitcoin is, is hope. Uh, what, 
again, something that I know you're passionate about. Do you think that the, that dream, like is America, this whole thing with, you know, people immigrating, obviously a massive issue right now too, currently your family, all of our families immigrated here at one time or another to America. Is it, is the American dream dead? Is it like Balaji said the other day, is it going to be like an, uh, the internet is the new nation state in a way? Is it Bitcoin is the nation state? Like what, what do you think things look like going forward here? And like, I think you just said the other day too, or maybe it was just earlier, maybe a deja vu, but it's, um, you know, like your, your, your family came here, but then you might be leaving here, you know, like if not physically, maybe it's mentally, figuratively, I don't know, but what are your, what are your thoughts on what, you know, what is that Bitcoin is hope with young, young, younger generations? How does that look for them? Well, it is really crazy to think that America did represent all of those values and all of that economic hope and opportunity. And and for so many people around the world who have it so much worse, it still is, right? That's why so many people are desperately, I mean, risking their lives even to try to come here. Um, and And unfortunately the american dream i don't believe is as easy to achieve anymore and it's been it's been hijacked and i don't know if i would say it's completely dead because i still think that there is a lot of opportunity um aided by actually tools like the internet and the decentralization of media that's why i'm able to do what i do but it is it's far more difficult because we've really placed a massive weight on the working class through our economic system. Um, and, and being the global reserve currency actually also contributed to that pain because we have to export all of our, our all of our dollars. We have to artificially strengthen our currency, which weakens our industrial and working base. So all the things that my mother loved so much and coveted when she was young from America, well, we no longer make any of that. We don't have that productive capability anymore. And now our biggest export is just our debt our 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 bonds and we financialized everything so it's it's just crazy to think how much harder it is to achieve that dream whereas a couple decades ago one american salary could afford a pretty nice american home and and that's what a lot of people just wanted right some something kind of simple and safe and nurturing of a family to be able to provide for kids so that they could thrive for their futures and today it's just it's so much harder and we've really pulled into not only two teams but i think like two two economic classes it's really the haves and the have nots and the have nots are far bigger than the haves um in terms of numbers um and it's really sad to see and so we we need a fix right? I mean, all of us can identify the fact that there is a problem and maybe we all define it differently and everyone's really great at, at sharing what the symptoms are, but what is the solution? And I think we really need to be solutions focused. We need to stop just complaining about the problems and do something. And that's why I love Bitcoin so much and Bitcoiners because it's solution focused. It's like, let's all peacefully go onto this life raft and start rebuilding a new economic system that at its base layer is more fair and resistant to the type of corruption that we see so that we can create a better future for everyone involved, including the generations that come after us. Um, and so that's why Bitcoin to me is the embodiment of hope. You, again, we're, you know, we're talking a lot about you know, hope and, you know, deep rooted, you know, familial things and things of that nature. I do have a, a sense that you have taken to the the macro side as well, and just kind of your arc of uh, of learning that side over the last few years. Am I way off base to say that that that's something that's kind of snuck up on you, even where it's like, man, I really kind of like the macro side of things, and and you you can speak so well, waxing poetic about the macro and treasury bonds. I think did that ever <laughs> cross your like thing, you know, like your brain like ten years ago, thinking I'm going to be knowing all about this someday. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. I, I, I wish I could go back and actually study and maybe get a degree in economics, although the one I probably would have gotten is very Keynesian and, and central central sure. authority focused, right? Um, but yeah. it does fascinate me so much. And I'm really grateful that um, I, I, I believe that when preparation meets opportunity, that's luck. I think, I don't know who said that originally, but um, I think yeah. my background of communication and media and being able to um, tell a story has really helped the fact that I'm now very prepared for this moment in time where Bitcoin is very, very important for people to understand. And so maybe, maybe that's, it's like lucky, right? Um, that those two worlds are coming together for me. Uh, but I certainly, I did not know that I would love economics so much. And every <laughs> yeah. book that I read is pretty much like an economics book in some way, shape or form. <laughs> that's so funny. 
It really is. Like, I, but I mean, I'm when just, you really I'm, think about it, it's like you, that is the base layer of human activity is economics. It's me providing something for you. And and what I've learned about capitalism, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, Brandon, like I used to be one of the people who thought we need to tax the rich and this system is unfair and we needed to distribute because why does why do billionaires have that? They don't need that. We need to redistribute to the other people so that more people have opportunity. I did not understand capitalism. I did not understand what it was really about at its core, which is savings and accumulating capital. And it's not supposed to be just this system of credit where we issue IOUs to a limitless degree and everyone is basically chasing after paper promises that are worth nothing because they can just continue to issue more and more. I did not realize that. I thought capitalism was about greed and it's not. It's actually capitalism is very selfless in the sense that you have to provide a good or service and create value for someone else and for the greater community for you to get anything in return. Um, but we live in a system where you don't have to create anything. The producers, they just create more units and they benefit from them at the expense of everyone else who's working so hard to produce value. And so everything's flip-flopped. And I think you really need to dig into some of this to really fully appreciate it. And that's why like, I don't, I don't get um, like riled up that people are so political on one side or the other, because at my core, I'm just like, you, you, they just don't understand. It's like they're placing the blame on the wrong thing and, and they're here up on like the surface and they need to go down to the sand um, because it's truly the economic issues that they're all complaining about and, and they don't realize it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I took the thoughts right out of my head. Um, yeah. And it makes me think of capitalism. You know, it's, impossible to have capitalism when you're on a faulty monetary base you know you're, yeah. you're building like you said sand you know like you just mentioned sand when you're building on a on, on sand your house on sand good luck you know credit I mean, is not capital credit is right. not money <laughs> is that yeah so therefore not capitalism like that's a plus b equals c it's it's kind of right there and and it's like you said and you said many times in just different interviews or interviewing other people like how can it seems so absurd when you don't get it. But once you do see it, you see the wizard behind the curtain, it's obvious, you know, like, I, I don't know. I don't know how you square that circle. Like, it's so, it's so hard to, and we've all gone through, like we just said, like, you have to go through this gauntlet almost and the ups and downs in order to get it. Like, Bob Proctor is one of my favorite personal development men, women of all time. And he always would say, like, I can't give you, or I can't put in your head what I have in my head because I can't remember what it is now, but it's, I can't give you what I have because you have too much of what you have in your head, basically. And it's, you have to go through it. And a lot of times you experience things. And I think that you, the education side and in helping to educate people is, is I know that's my mission. I, I'm sure it is yours too. And I'm sure it's a lot of Bitcoiners where it's like, you want to, you, you see the bad things coming, the patterns, and you want to minimize the collateral damage. And that's, you, you know, you know, you're going to go through some hard times, but can we, Hey guys, can we minimize this a little bit? Like, I, I don't want it, all of us to get burned in the process. What do you have any, you know, like a, a piece or two of like um, advice, I guess, for people that again, are going to be coming into the space here going forward, like whether they're producing content or they're thinking of starting a blog or, or a podcast or something like that, where maybe some lessons you've learned or things you can, you know, advise or uh, just, pack people and say, Hey, just keep going. Uh, anything like that at all to people who are just getting the space or, or thinking of, of firing something up? So yeah, so many things. I mean, Bitcoin education is I think one of the most important things that any of us could be a part of because we can reach so many people and it, it really truly can empower the greatest amount of people in the most important way. Um, I, I want to credit Jeff Booth for this advice because I really do believe in, in what he shared and that's you have to meet people where they are um, because I think that we all think we understand and we, we all sort of agree to things that none of us voted for, right? Like 2% inflation. What is that? Do we even think about it? Did we, did we talk about inflation prior to the pandemic and the CPI going crazy? Um, yeah. But yet it's been a reality that we've lived with that none of us, um, again, voted for or chose that has a tremendous amount of consequences. Um, and yet people just, they don't understand. They, they accept the fact that things get more expensive in certain aspects of life and other things maybe get cheaper like your electronics and 
And so we need to question those things more and help help people ask those questions. And, and I think that that's one of the greatest ways to start to orange pill someone is ask them those very questions. Like why, why are houses getting so much, why is a house that's, you know, 150 years old more expensive now than when it was brand new, right? It's like, well, that's interesting, right? Um, and when it comes to creating content or just pursuing things like, like what you're doing, what what I'm doing, it's just, A, I think you need to believe in yourself. I think you need to take risks and try things because you learn through trial and you grow through trial and struggle and challenges. Um, and learning is a very critical uh, component to all of this. Um, and also just, I, I would say, it's so helpful when you can specialize in something. Like I didn't realize being a reporter, I was kind of a jack of all trades, but an expert in nothing until Bitcoin where I was like, oh, wow, this is really interesting. And I'm going to go down to the sand and really learn everything I can about it. And I never intended for it to be my career, but there's always a demand for specialization and for people who can communicate different specialties. And so um, it ended up working tremendously to my advantage that I focused on one thing as opposed to maybe diluting myself into many different things, right? Or pursuing many things at the same time. So I really think that people should devise a plan, stick to that plan A, don't even don't even look at a plan B, like really focus and specialize and learn as much as you can and surround yourself with the people that are better than you and smarter than you so that you can like learn and grow through osmosis as well. Yeah, that's great advice. I it was just, I was thinking of, again, like you, you went to Pepper, number one, how did you end up at Pepperdine, by the way? So t telling stories, you made me think of this, like telling yeah. stories, journalism, and it's so important because again, I think sales is telling stories. I mean, Jesus went around, what do you do? He told stories, you know, he told parables. He knew that was how humans learn best. You have to sell through stories and just like, Hey, 21 million decentralization, Yahoo, like logic doesn't work. That's not that's not how this works. You, you justify the logic later. So I think that you, you hit the nail on the head. Like you have to learn how to tell stories and you over the last, not just couple of years, but last, you know, decade plus have become very good at telling stories. Uh, but it leads me to, you know, your, your, some, some of that upbringing, I guess, in a way, going to Pepperdine, going to school, talk to me about that really quick. How did you end up that far away? Cause that's in LA area, correct. And you were in Chicago. Like how yeah. did, how did that all work? And how did that lead to, journalism and you got into Italian and stuff and you're speaking all these languages. Like what? The, how did that come about? <laughs> I know my, my background is actually really, uh, it's really random. Um, yeah. So growing up, I knew I wanted to work within storytelling, like video storytelling, because um, w frankly, we just watched a lot of it. We watched a ton of news and um, movies and television. And largely that really helped my family uh, learn English. It was to augment mm -hmm. their English skills. So something was always on. And I think, I think there were many points where I was kind of torn between the two worlds. I didn't know if I wanted to work in the fiction or the nonfiction world. Mm. Like I loved, I loved um, fairy tales and movies and sitcoms and things like that. But I also loved documentaries and, and news interviews. I, I loved like Barbara Walters and all of her sit downs. So frankly, I only looked at Los Angeles schools because I thought, well, mm. if I don't, if I want to work within the world of like visual storytelling, what, what is the capital of that? And I saw that being Los Angeles. Um, and so I only looked at schools in that area and I did a summer school program at UCLA. I thought it was a little too big. Um, and Pepperdine was like just right. And I liked that it was a, a religious school cause I grew up a family in a family of faith. And so, yeah, I mean, I just found myself there and ended up spending two of the years, four semesters in Italy. I created the Italian major at Pepperdine, yeah. super random. <laughs> Thought wow, I was going to become like a Italian show documentarian, <laughs> like Stanley Tucci basically had my dream job. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's crazy. And, then, did, and, and I did not about? know anything about Bitcoin, unfortunately, back then. Yeah. Well, that was, it was just coming out. I mean, we're, I'm trying to think we're the same age, basically. So that was, yeah, we couldn't have really known about it at that time. Um, I guess it was early on. Was that, well, I guess that was, would have been, was that early 2010s, though, I guess, or mid 2010s when you did that, though? The grad, no, the grad it was, school? Um, that was not, sorry, when that I was grad graduating, yeah. that when was I was graduating into the great financial crisis, Bitcoin was essentially right. born. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So sorry. I was thinking of uh, Northwestern was a little bit later on. Correct. That was, that's yeah. what was, yeah. yeah. 
that okay yeah that's um, when when i decided that it was going to be news that i focused on i did i did yeah. go back to school um i actually wouldn't recommend it like i i'm gl i'm proud that i have a master's of science in in journalism but it's not necessary like honestly everything right. the more that you do it's so great that people now you don't even have to pay all these crazy degrees you can literally learn everything online and you have a device that gives you more knowledge yeah. than kings and queens had centuries mm -hmm. ago so you know don't feel pressure because i sometimes i'm like i could have used that if i would have just put the money i spent on grad oh, school boy. into bitcoin whew, oh, i'd be in a different position I, <laughs> I did this i went on this like again i know this is like the whole crowd health thing and, and, and which is where I eventually ended up in essence but like three or four years ago i just like lost it one summer and i was like we we're up north in michigan people go up north which you're from chicago uh -huh. so you kind of you know yeah. that this area and how people yeah. think but anyway so we're up north and i was like listening to it was like four years ago i'm listening to like max and stacy and they're just going on and on about health insurance and all that stuff and i'm like already was like starting to get really ticked off for like a year or two before that and premiums were like 400 bucks and then it was like 600 bucks a month and then it was just like every year was going up the deductible was like 10,000 14,000 we're having more kids i'm like what is going on right now and i'm like I'm just getting rid of all this. Like, I don't, I don't need it. We're young or healthy. And if I, something bad happens, I'll write a really sad story on a crowdfunding thing and I'll raise the money. Like I'm an entrepreneur, like I'll figure it out. And uh, so my parents are like, no, you can't do that. Like you can't like, you, you know, my mom's like freaking out. I'm like, it's okay. Like if I would have put this thousand dollars a month, every month for the last five years into Bitcoin, you know where I'd be. I own the damn insurance company. So just like, you know, same exact thought. What, um, where did where did the Italian come in though? So the dancing really briefly and the Italian. Where did this where did these things come into the picture? Is it sports, music, art growing up? Is it just the dancing? Like <laughs> where does Italian and, and all this stuff come into play? Um okay. I've never been asked this, but uh yeah, so I, I grew up dancing. I was a ballerina and did all all forms of dance. And so I was on my high school dance team and uh, college dance team actually. And oh, wow. and then and then I and then funny story about that, my my moment of pride. I I worked at a small station. My very first on air job was in Palm Springs, California, and they had this annual charity there called Dancing with the Desert Stars, which was like <laughs> my favorite show at the time. And so they chose me as one of the contestants. And I ended up winning. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, uh, the Italian, um, that was actually a beautiful side story passion. It's still a passion of mine. I'm literally staring at a, a photo of Italy that's on the wall across from me. Um, I One of the reasons I loved Pepperdine is because almost everyone goes overseas their whole sophomore year. They are very encouraging of international experiences for, for growth and for um, better finding like your calling or vocation. That's another thing I loved about the school. Like everything from the very start was what are you called to do that is of, ser Ooh, of cool. service that you can like help um, others and how can you make the world a better place? Like literally first day orientation, wow. it was like, what is your vocation? What is your calling? What has God called you to do? And I love, I loved that. Um, and so sophomore year, literally all the students just disperse, uh, unless you're like a bio major or maybe you're in theater and you have to stay close by, but pretty much everyone, everyone I knew went overseas to one of nine programs. And, um, it was just by happenstance. I had studied French for like eight years. So I was full on thinking that I was going to go to their French program and they had like an issue, a housing issue. And that was the one program that shut down for my sophomore year until they worked out like another uh, location that they were going to trade with or whatever. So, um, so I had to choose between like Germany, London, Italy, um, Shanghai, uh, Heidelberg, Germany, a bunch of places. So I chose Italy. Um, and then I went there not knowing really anything and not knowing any Italian. And I just, I fell in love with the culture and the history, which is so cool now with Bitcoin because um, I was in Florence where the Florin, right? The heart of the <laughs> Renaissance, which was all based on the gold standard. And I just love, I thought the architecture was so beautiful and the art, and it's all examples of that low time preference. You know, what, what humans could create if they put, their drive and ingenuity and spirit into works. Um, and I just I just loved it. I fell in love with it. I traveled all over Italy and now it's my favorite country to this day. It's like anyone, everyone tries to get me to go other places and I go and I'm like, I still love Italy the most. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how God, you know, weaves, you know, 
his magic, you know, I shouldn't say not magic, but it's just, he weaves his, his plan, you know, and, and it just makes me think of, and you, and you and I kind of talked about this last year, a little bit at Pacific Bitcoin. And it was just, you know, between the kids and just everything and how crazy his stuff is. I mean, you guys have been traveling around all over the place. Um, and then, yeah. you know, whether it's, whether, whether it's doing that or you got kids or there are kids on the way or whatever it is, but just the thing, I can't remember exactly what I was talking to you about or what we are talking about now, but the thing that was on my mind has been on my mind for a long time is um, picking up your cross and laying down your life. And, and that was, you know, just even my journey of, of getting rid of basically firing myself from my real estate firm, real estate investing and raising money and doing all those things you thought you had to do at the top of the stack in the fiat world. You're on the Titanic and it's going down. You don't know it, but you're like, Hey, this is the best thing I can do. I'm rearranging as many deck chairs as I can. And then you just realize, like, man, I got to get in that lifeboat. Like, this is, I'm being called somewhere else. And I knew it for 20 years, in essence, and it was very political growing up. And, and then realized when, when 08, 09, 10, when we were graduating, like, oh boy, like there's a game being played, started studying money, and then getting really frustrated and mad because I was like, they, they have, they've been playing us this whole time, the Federal Reserve, Creature from Jekyll Island, and all these things. And mm -hmm. the thing the last few years, though, really since the lockdowns, has just been, you know, following, like you said, that calling, that's why, I, like what you just said with at Pepperdine, like, what's your calling? Like, what are you called to do? What is God calling you to do truly? And, and, and doing the right thing, you know, making the, the moral decisions and, um, and, and just following that plan and being, cause that's going to have you the most fulfilled, at least, you know, in my opinion, that's going to have you the most fulfilled. So where are you called to be? And that's where for me, it just became like, I, I have to go do something else. I can't keep doing it. It's not fair to any of you people because I'm not in it like I should be. It's not fair to me. It's not fair to my family. Um, so anyway, that's I really resonate with that, too, because that's just a thing that's been in my head for a number of years now. And um, and really trying yeah. to humble yourself, lower your ego, raise your humility mm -hmm. and it, which is Bitcoin in a way, too. Right. It's 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 not an IQ test. It's a humility test. And I think that's yeah. the, the really big thing. Um, so anyway, you can t touch on any of that, but it's, I, I think that it's you, the, the, all that stuff, it all kind of plays together. Like, and I don't know how many people know you had, you started the podcast when you're at the end of your fiat job, uh, career stories, which, you know, led into what you're doing now. And that started, what was like three, four years ago in 2021, I believe. Correct. And you, I started it. Yeah. I started career stories, which was like the original podcast in 2018. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then so it led fun. into obviously what we, many of us know now is coin stories, right. And it, it became something else, or I shouldn't say it's, that's still there. So people can go find that. Um, but you have coin stories now, which is, is the thing in, in talking Bitcoin, which is incredible. And if anyone's been to your site, it's amazing, by the way. So whoever's doing your site, I think I saw at the bottom who does it. I can't remember her name on my head, but amazing site. I love your site. Thank you. Yeah, Heather. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Um, yeah, no, it's it's really it's really crazy how, again, technology, media, information has decentralized and it really has transformed so many people's lives and jobs. And I really do um, equate this time period in Bitcoin when people are still very unfamiliar and a little bit wary about it to those early days of the internet when we had no idea how much it would impact everything that we do, how we communicate, the type of jobs that we do. Um, and, and so not to, not to be afraid of it, not to push away from disruptive technology, but to really embrace it and to learn as much as you can about it because it will really it will really be to your advantage. And my industry itself changed so much because of technology over the 10 years that I worked in it. I mean, from when I was aspiring to work in news, when it was like the golden era of television and everyone sat down at five or six o'clock to watch and they knew their local news people and all of that. And there was so much money in advertising because there were only a few channels and there were only a few avenues to get that information breaking apart and splintering into all these websites and Twitter and social journalists and people having their own channels and YouTube. I mean, it's crazy the, the evolution that happened. And for me, I always loved long form interviews because I just think you learn a lot and you get more context that sometimes is very necessary to the, to the crux of the story. Yeah. And my job was all about brevity. It was, um, which is to my advantage in some ways today, right? Like you got to like sum it up really fast, but True. I would spend like eight hours a day, nine hours a day or a whole week or month working on something that was 90 seconds long or two minutes long. Um, like two and a half minutes is an eternity in television. Like if you get that much time, it, that's a lot. <laughs> 
And so my life was all about shortening things and cutting stuff out, leaving things out. And, and I really liked long form. So I, um, I think I needed to have that outlet. So I did the first podcast, which was career stories. And it was really just like origin stories of people within different industries, how they achieved success, what challenges they overcame. And I've always been someone um, who loves rags to riches stories, like someone who came from absolutely nothing and achieved so much. Like how the heck did they do it? I love those stories. So that was like the the um, or, or origination of career stories, which then turned into coin stories because I took that and I was like, I'm just going to do a season and interview the Bitcoiners about this very topic and see where they all came from. And then now it's been my job for the last almost two years, two, almost three years, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. Did you know, I can, I, I know you've talked about this before, but you didn't know really anyone in the space, right? Like you went to, you know, Bitcoin uh, 2021, I think, right? And you just kind of yeah. went into the, you know, VIP or the back and we're just like, hey, you started asking people, can I interview you? Like, how, how did that, did you know anyone in the space when you, when you came in? Yeah. So, yeah. So I'll clarify that. So first of all, um, because I was a reporter, I literally had to go every day knocking on doors, asking people on their worst day, by the way, I mean, when a tragedy just happened, like, hey, will you talk to me? And not only talk to me, but like with a camera in your face. So I I have no shame. Like I will ask anyone to talk to me. I am I will ask in a cry. I'm, I'm not shy because like, you can't, you can't be shy. That's, that's you can't be shy. And <laughs> you cannot be shy as a journalist. You'll get nowhere. Um, no one will talk to you. So I, I got a media pass for the Bitcoin conference because some of the people who I um, messaged, who were the public figures that everyone's familiar with, who have been on my show, some of them responded and I was super excited. They said, yes, I'll come on your show. But a lot of them absolutely did not respond to me. So I said to myself, well, um, I'm probably better at doing this in person. Like, I think that they'll see that I'm genuine. I just want to learn more. So I'm just going to buy a ticket or go or try to get a media pass and try to meet them in person and just ask them in person. And so I did. I got a media pass. Thank you, Bitcoin conference. <laughs> and uh, I asked I asked Safedine to come on my show and Michael Saylor. And I met Preston that first. I met so many people and they ended up on my show and it ended up working out very well. I'm very grateful to be doing what I'm doing. But yeah, I, I, I people I think don't take enough chances and sometimes people are very afraid and they're they're in their own head. Like we're all our worst enemy and worst critic. And no one is thinking about you as much as you think that they're thinking about you, right? We all compare ourselves, especially with social media. It's like, oh no, but he, but she, like nobody cares about you. They're all worried about themselves. So like, if you want something, just go for it and be nice about it, right? I mean, people tend to want to help people who are nice and genuine and like, don't, they're not trying to get something from you. And so um, I hope that that's, serves as an inspiration to people because there's there's someone out there probably watching, listening. They want to do something and it's like, you're holding yourself back. No one else is. So go do it. That's a great point. That's such a great point. And like you said, everyone's focused on themselves. That's just human nature, right? So it's like just getting out of your own yeah. way. It's, I love that. And some pe if some people are not nice or don't want to talk, that's okay too. You wish them well and maybe someday that'll answer. change. Like that's okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Here's your answer. Don't need to be around them anymore. <laughs> like that's, yeah, so well said. I know we're getting uh, getting towards wrapping here soon. What um, we got a couple a couple things for you. What so you just had Andy Sheckman on the other day, by the way, and he's mm -hmm. I love Andy Sheckman. He's he's just awesome. Like I, I don't know what it is about him, but like I just love him. And yeah. uh, I, I saw him like a year ago on Kiyosaki show or something like that. It's the first time I'd ever seen him. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he's just he's amazing. He's such like a down to earth person, and uh, mm -hmm. a really cool show you guys had the other day about him. Again, like the orange pill, right? Like you can see the wheels turning, yeah. you can see things yeah. moving and happening. Like again, a sign of humility. Uh, that's a, someone I respect. I'm like, okay, I respect totally. this guy. Very cool. And so he, he said something that I think is really interesting. And I think he boiled it down to really this fight that we're having, that everyone's having, you know, in a way, especially like gold bugs in, in, um, in Bitcoiners and things of that nature, like a George Gammon kind of similar to this in a well with like him and Jeff Booth going back and forth. But like where, where George thinks that, you know, society's not going to change. Like Bitcoin's not going to change people enough to do what you're saying, Jeff. I agree with everything else. Or, but an Andy Sheckman says, "Hey, I think that it's the decentralization of money. The centralized powers aren't going to accept that." So, my question to you is, 
aren't we the 99%? Like, isn't politics downstream from culture? Don't these people have to do what we say? Coming back kind of full circle to like us educating people, minimizing collateral damage, isn't it up to us to keep educating people in this human system, which Bitcoin is, it's a human system, to keep educating, to show people there is a different way and force people to change. That's really, I mean, are we too idealistic? Are we, are we just not cynical enough, Natalie? Like, I don't know, you know, like, what are your thoughts on this? Is I think those two kind of distillations are really the crux of like the, the arguments between a lot of the, these big factions of people. Yeah, I mean, we do have the numbers on our side, the the working class of the world, um, as opposed to the elites, um, as as some people refer to them. I think that I've said this on uh, Fox News at one point. Um, this is a bottom up phenomenon. This is the way that money should be. It's emerging from a free market, the freest market that I see in any any industry. Um, and it is really amazing that it does empower people so, so incredibly through property rights, through the ability to save for the future anywhere in the world. Excess, I mean, the largest addressable market of any asset in the whole world. Anyone can purchase a fraction of a Bitcoin. You can't just be in a developing nation and purchase a share of Apple stock or a fraction of a Manhattan skyscraper, but you can get a couple of Satoshis um, or, or start to earn them through through work and through productivity. So it's incredibly inspiring. And I, I believe in the human spirit. I believe in us moving toward the things and the technologies that serve us and make us more productive. Um, and so I, I do believe that the power lies with us. And, and just in the same way, again, sort of like what we touched on the early days of the internet before, the internet, I, I guess, you know, there were there were forces of control that were resistant to the internet and to encryption, and and we've seen that. Then that wasn't very long ago, but open source technology ended up winning. The people ended up winning, and now this decentralized force is used by uh, billions of people around the world who are able to communicate and send information and and create businesses that are interconnected, and and I think that. The monetary protocol, the the Bitcoin network, will do um, very similar things and empower people globally. And nation states will have to embrace it as opposed to resist it, or they will fall behind and they will be at a disadvantage. Um, I think that powers, the power structures, are maybe apprehensive about Bitcoin because it threatens their monopoly over issuing money and threatens their monopoly over capital. Um, and it is sort of, you know, the internet is non-rivalrous as opposed to bit money is rivalrous and there is a lot of competition and, and who issues it and who controls it, monitors it, who's the, the intermediary. But I, I still just believe in open source technology and the will of the people and the majority using this and therefore it will win through through adoption and growth alone. Who have you not interviewed yet that you want to interview? Oh, there are so many people. Uh, towards the top of the list is Thomas Sowell. He's the Ooh. brilliant economist and author. I, I love his writings and I've seen so many interviews and I would just love, 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 love to sit down with him. Um, Felix Zuloff, I would like to sit down with for the macro side. Um, I would love to interview Joe Rogan and Elon Musk and Arnold Schwarzenegger. I feel like Arnold is like so ripe for orange pilling, but um, maybe we'll get there soon. Uh, I think it's really important for us to branch out and to bridge this gap with people who are very influential, who I think they get it. They get that there's a problem and they're able to identify some of the issues, but they just need a little bit of extra help um, at connecting the dots to Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of people on the list. We'll see. Some of them don't respond to me, but that's okay. I'll keep trying. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's so cool. That's same. I, I couldn't agree more. I think that... Um... Like I know I I've reached out to um just some like, you know, women. We were talking about this earlier. I've reached out to some women. So like there's a lot of big, you know, influencers, I guess. I I can't stand the word influencer, but I don't know what else to call them. Me neither. Um, yeah. I, when people call me like that, a, I cringe. I'm like, no, I no, know. no. <laughs> Such a fiat term. Like we got we gotta think of like a Bitcoin or term for it. <laughs> but <laughs> I, you know, there's like a lot of women, there's a lot of people like on Twitter that have really big followings that, you know, have a voice in the, in the political, you know, like you said, they, they're kind of in between, they're very ripe for orange pilling. And 
they're like libertarian, you know, the, I think it's like what the redheaded libertarian, right? There's some really big, you know, accounts out there of people that are really, they're right there. And it's like, man, I would love to interview some of those people, like these people that are on the fence and their audience is obviously like just outside of Bitcoin probably, but you, you just can imagine how many people would be drawn in to like, oh wait, like what? Oh, like, wow. so I think that that's like, I feel like that, like this year and next year, I think those conversations, like you said, whether it's you or me or whoever, like, I think those are going to really start happening more. And I think it's going to be really cool to see. So I love that you said that. Um, yeah, would, I mean, actually, I'm going to be sharing in the next couple of weeks an interview with Nikki Glazer, who she has a massive following. She's a comedian um, who's based here. And I, I was curious her takes on on Bitcoin and this whole space, um, because she has very openly talked about money and talked about what she thinks is wrong in the system and inflation and prices going crazy and the majority of people not being able to keep up with that, um, including aspiring comedians like that she can relate to, um, younger versions of herself. And so um, I just think it's, again, it's important to have those conversations. And I, I could tell that I, I piqued her curiosity and now she wants to learn more because I essentially um, – I let her know that all of the problems that she just so easily identified, Bitcoin is trying to fix and Bitcoin was sort of designed to fix. And so that made her very like, oh, like I want, you know, I want to learn more. And so those are like the little, we got to keep, you know, planting those seeds all over the place because they will grow. <laughs> have to, have to. Do you, in a couple more quick things here, what did you, um, Again, did you think, I mean, even a couple of years ago when you started doing this, did you think you would become the, uh, the, the queen bee, the, qu the queen Bitcoin uh, of uh, okay. the host of, of Bitcoin? I mean, you're all over the place. I mean, you're, you're everywhere. I mean, we're lucky to have you. Uh, it just, you're so well-spoken, fortunately, and so smart that um, in, you know, like you said, preparation, meeting opportunity is luck. And I'm a big believer in that too. Like there's no such thing as like luck per se, right? Or like uh, mm -hmm. karma, I don't believe in that. It's just preparation, meeting opportunity, being in the right place, following your calling, picking up your cross, laying down your life, right? Like all these things. And um, did you ever in your wildest dreams, again, like two, three years ago, see, and, and I know you kind of probably saw yourself in the sense of like, hey, I'm going to keep working my ass off. I'm going to get better at what I do. But do you ever sit back and be like, oh, this is like, this is wild. Like, do you ever like have that moment or like, <laughs> Like, what am I doing? I'm like, every week it's like you're somewhere else doing something else. And you're just like, what is going on? You have, there has to be moments like that. It has been a crazy journey. I'm, I'm beyond grateful. Uh, I don't know if you saw that clip of the NVIDIA CEO speaking recently uh, to, I think it was like Stanford grads. But he, he said that you should have low expectations and that struggle is actually one of the most important things to building character and to finding success. And I really agree with that. Um, I believe that you should have low expectations, but very high standards. I always knew one thing, and that was that I was willing to do anything to be financially secure and not repeat sort of the childhood scarcity that I experienced when it came to money. I wanted to be able to help my parents and help my, my future children. And the thing that is so crazy about this system when I finally learned about it is it's like, no matter how hard you work, this is why so many people are frustrated and have lost hope. That goalpost keeps moving and gets, keeps getting further and further away. And so again, I was one of those people who I had worked so hard and I knew I was capable of getting to like the national level and, and excelling in journalism. And I worked really hard to do that. And I focused really hard. But even even when I got to national, I like did, wasn't making enough money to afford what I would consider to be sort of that comfortable middle class life. Um, and I was like, why was there something wrong with this? Right? Like there's something wrong with this system. And so I'm so grateful that Bitcoin sort of represented this rebirth in my own career and belief that the future could be so bright and beautiful because I was starting to look at it as one of of a lack of hope and opportunity and thinking that I was always going to be treading water and maybe never afford a house. And Bitcoin has made me believe that I will be able to not only produce and generate and accumulate wealth, but also preserve it and then hopefully hand it over to my children someday. And, and I understand why so many young people, they're like, I, I can't afford to have kids like because I was starting to wonder that that as well. And that's like if everyone just stopped having kids, we wouldn't have no more world. Right. Like we're I love the fact that now I can think about the future and, and not worry and stress and have so much anxiety about it. And so 
I'm so grateful. I'm, I, there's not a day that goes by that I'm not grateful and that I don't feel a great sense of responsibility to keep working super, super hard because there are still so many people who haven't heard this message or who haven't heard it in a way that communicates to to them in order to take action. And that's all I want to do. Like, I just want to help people understand. I want to do good by people. Um, I do believe in like the law of attraction and karma and all that. Like if you put goodness out, you will get it back. And like, I really believe that the world could be so beautiful and prosperous with so much more cooperation if we fix the money and Bitcoin is the best fix that I see out there. Yeah, it really is. I, I think of, and I just want, and I, I tear up every single time uh, watching Tomer's video, uh, Generational Wealth, wow, that yeah. he and Matt Hornick did and, and Swan put together. Yeah. It's just, it's incredible. And it's just, you. how can yeah. you not think that, you know, as you go into it and, and just watch that. And yep. that's the vision I think we all see. Um, all right, last, last thing before we do a quick word association game to wrap up here, but you have been in so many of these. I think you're <laughs> one of the most... Uh, featured people in Bitcoin trading cards. So um, how did this, did you, first off, what did you collect as a kid? I know like I every no kid always scarcity. has like the thing. What like do you mean? <laughs> what, what was it? Is it, there's no, there's no scarcity in the Natalie card. Darn it. <laughs> what do you mean? No, there's there. This is 52 of 500. Let's That's go. That's a lot. Okay. Well. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying that you've been featured multiple times in Bitcoin trading cards. And um, oh, so you've been. Oh, well, that's nice. Unconfiscatable cards these but what what did you collect as a kid did you collect i guess it could have been cards dolls what did you hoard as a kid was there anything like that that you collected <laughs> i did have like a pet rock collection or like stone collection at one point <laughs> but no i actually still collect something to this day really i collect yes i i have a few of them right over there um i collect the book the little prince in every language really Mm -hmm. So I have a, I have like a big one that's kind of like a pop up. I have a French one, a Portuguese, Italian, Lithuanian, um, Spanish. Yeah. So I love I love the book, The Little Prince. I love the message behind it, and I love the author. Um, so yeah, got to find all the languages. <laughs> that's awesome. I, is that just is something from like childhood, like growing up? Is that why, or is that like? early on yeah, yeah yeah it's 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 so like cool. a childhood but very popular in france it originated in france um mm. and it's just like a very positive message about hope and um just kind of the young innocent spirit of childhood that i hope we all could maintain because i mean even to your earlier points about people in this space or adjacent to it who look at bitcoin as like oh, this could never work because of course the people will resist it. Well, we're we're really in control of that. And yeah. you create the world that you live in. You create the yeah. future that you um, put out by your actions and your attitude. And so, yeah, if you say it's never going to happen, it won't happen for you. But I believe in building what we want to see. So I have total hope and, and faith in the future. I love it. All right. Last thing here little word association. We got uh, a dozen or two uh, words. So it can be one word answer. It can be whatever comes to your head. And I will go through them and uh, quick as long as you want, I guess, when I go through them here. Character. Struggle. You have to have struggle to build character. Italy. <laughs> Love. Passion. The best country in the world. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Bitcoin conferences. Really fun. And hopefully more women soon. <laughs> They're coming. Dancing. Freeing. Just feels so good to just let loose. Speaking of women, women in Bitcoin. There will be more and more and more. The next big class, I think, of, a, of adoption will be the millennial women, and I hope to be a part of it. <laughs> That's so cool. Men in Bitcoin. My brothers. I have so many great big brothers. I have like a lot of big brothers that I love, <laughs> and, and I love my own big brother who's not really a Bitcoiner, but I love my Bitcoin bros. <laughs> That's awesome. He will be eventually. Politics. There's too much of it. It's too divisive. I like a political Bitcoin. Federal Reserve. 
uh, has too much power. We really need to decentralize the power of money. Satoshi Nakamoto. Brilliant. Genius. Would love to interview him or meet him. <laughs> oh, man. Proof of work. Brilliant. Genius. Absolutely needed. Energy is truth. Legacy media. Um, facing greater competition from us in the decentralized world and needs to be held to account. Journalism. Necessary. Um, it needs to be the watchdog and it hasn't been, uh, and it needs to not be so political. Poland. Pol home. Um, a place that has endured so much and is vibrant, and I'm very proud to be from there. Debt spiral. Debt spiral? <laughs> Let's avoid it. <laughs> Catastrophe. Good one. Do not enter. <laughs> Integrity. Critical. So important. Um, I don't think it's it's worth living without integrity. I love that. Faith. Um, gives you hope for the future, gives you purpose. Natalie or Natalia? <laughs> Whichever <laughs> you prefer. My birth name is Natalia. So, uh, you know, people can start going for that. It's so funny. I actually, <laughs> when I moved here, this is a funny story. When I moved here, um, I was in Chicago where people have very thick Chicago accents. And I used to actually as well, I had to take vocal coaching classes and everyone would say Natalia, Natalia. And I was like, mm. and, yeah, and that wasn't the American, like people said, that's not the American name. It's Natalie. And so I changed it, but I kind of wish I didn't change it. So you can call me either. <laughs> I know I had to, I don't know if it was an interview or if it was us talking a year or two ago and that came up. So I don't know. I just like had to ask. And cause that's something that yeah. I think that people will find Natalia. cool. And don't know. My birth name's Natalia. Yeah. Yes. So cool. Uh, Sam Callahan. My love, my partner, my Bitcoiner that I'm going to hodl for life. <laughs> <laughs> Number of children. As many as God will give me. I'm not, as young as I wish I was to start that process, but that is okay. Age is just a number. <laughs> God's plan. God's plan. Travel. Uh, just, I love it so much. It immerses you and opens up your world to so many things. And I always learn so much. Values. It's what you stand for. It's who you are. Um, and I think, we need a return to a sense of, of values and honor. Uh, we've lost a lot of that in society. Oh, boy, oh boy. America. Still the American dream. I really believe that we can revive it. I do too. Hopefully that's, that's why I keep this back here. Of me, yeah. of me playing on the U.S. under 17, 18 team. It's still there deep inside all of us. Mm -hmm. Chicago. I mean, I grew up there too cold, but it's my hometown. <laughs> so gotta love it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. LA. Oh, I miss the I miss the sunshine. I really do. Um uh, a beautiful city that has lost its way. Creed or pump it up. Creed or pump it up? I don't understand the question. Which which song? You had to choose. Oh, one. the song. Oh, higher. I guess I should say the song. Okay, higher yeah. or pump it up. I think pump it up. <laughs> <laughs> I same, same. Last two Bitcoin trading cards. I have my favorite cards. I've collected my my favorite figures, so I'm excited about it. I hope they're worth a lot of money someday. <laughs> <laughs> don't we all and coin stories um my my dream come true i'm so grateful i can't believe i get to do this for a living and it's all because of the people who watch and listen so i can't thank them enough so cool i'm going to finish this 
this show with the question that you used to ask on career story interviews. What would you tell your younger self? <laughs> Learn about money and um, believe in yourself more. I wish I studied money and I wish I believed in myself more, but uh, luckily I I somehow found my way to Bitcoin and to this work. And so um, things work out better than you than you always worry about. So don't worry so much. Well, I think I can speak for many people that I think you're you're doing fine. So we're we're <laughs> Bitcoin is lucky to have you. Bitcoin is lucky Thank to have you. Thank you. We all are. Thank so uh, where can people find you? Uh, the show is called Coin Stories on YouTube. I share episodes on X at Nat Brunel. Uh, TalkingBitcoin.com is my website. Uh, lots of fun projects in the works. So hopefully I'll be able to share more soon. So cool. Thank you so much, Natalie, for spending time with me today. Thank you. Thank you for checking out this episode of the Playable Characters Show brought to you by Bitcoin Trading Cards. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of the future Bitcoin and financial experts we have on the show. Plus, we will be doing random big giveaways throughout different moments of shows of collectible cards, sats, merch, and more from guests so you won't not miss anything. This show does not constitute any investment advice, only freedom advice. Everything you see here is opinions from the host and the guests themselves, nothing further. Please don't trust, verify. For full transparency, I do lead marketing efforts at Bitcoin Trading Cards where we are trying to spread freedom to all of humanity and orange pill the world one collectible physical trading card at a time by making things fun and easy to talk about that normally make you want to cry. You can reach me directly through my email, brandon at btc dash cards.com with any inquiries or playable character suggestions. See you on the next one.